Good morning, good afternoon, good evening around the world. Thank you for joining either our live Globinar or you're listening to this on the Global Podcast at Global Chamber. Uh, my name is Doug Brunke. I'm the founder and CEO of Global Chamber, and I have the distinct honor of speaking with Jennifer Clinton today. She's the president and CEO at Cultural Vistas. I've had the fortunate uh, occurrence to know Jennifer even in a prior life, and we are going to talk a little bit about her career, how she got to Cultural Vistas, and then, of course, the things that Cultural Vistas is doing today to make uh, business and government and interns and a lot of people's lives a lot better. So Jennifer, really appreciate you joining us today. I uh, wanted to start a little bit with a little bit about your background, which is so fascinating. You've been in several different uh, uh, regions of segments. Certainly nonprofit has been a recurring Theme, but you've been in government relations for quite a number of years. You've touched telecommunications. You've been involved with education industries. You're on a journey. And so here you are at Cultural Vistas. How in the world did this happen? You know, where you got to where you are and tell us a little bit more about that journey, if you would. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Happy to do that. But I just want to first thank, um, thank you for having me here today and, and just a shout out to you and your team and the Global Chamber. I've been a fan of, and you know, member of the organization for many years and I just have watched you grow the network and um, all of what you've done and just kudos to you. Just it, it's a really, really important network and I've gotten to um, know many of the members I just very much appreciate your, your sort of spirit of bringing us all together and, and, and helping spread the word about uh, the great work that that all your members are doing, so thank you. So a little bit about me, um, just kind of going back, where am I from? Um, I grew up in the Detroit metro area, um, and I think about that experience, and that was in you know, 70s, 80s, so I'll date myself, um, because I think I put that in perspective of Detroit in the 70s and 80s was very much, um, the perception was very, uh, strong that globalization had decimated that area. Um, and, you know, I, I think about that today of sort of my connection to the global community and um, my own sort of upbringing where it was very much a sort of a mixed feeling about globalization and what, what had happened um, to that city. Uh, and at, at the same time, you know, Detroit shares a border with Canada and so as a kid, I used to have, I had the fortunate opportunity to go to Canada a lot uh, as a kid. And that was really what inspired me to just think about different cultures, even though Canadian culture is not you know, enormously different from the US, there are differences. And it, I was always very intrigued by just even, you know, seeing French on signs and, um, you know, speaking with, with, uh, with Canadians and just, just appreciating crossing a border and um, having an experience of a different country and a, a different culture. Um, so fast forward, uh, get, get sort of getting that, that sort of global bug, I, um, I majored in French and um, uh, pursued a, a early career and an academic career in teaching uh, French language and literature at the university level. Um, did that for a number of years, but then decided that um, I had had some really incredible abroad experiences myself and decided that I, I, I wanted to get more involved in helping others actually, um, you know, have these uh, global experiences that really set them on a sort of different uh, trajectory, both um, mentally, physically, if you will. Um, so, so I moved into the world, it moved into, well, moved to Washington DC back in 98 and got involved in working on student exchange programs at the high school level. And Doug, as you said, worked on in government for the, um, what was the Oversight of Private Investment Corporation and telecom and, and then, and most of my career in the nonprofit sector and the education space, primarily in um, international education and really helping people step outside their comfort zone, step into a new environment and really learn about themselves and, and different cultures. And it's just given me great joy to be, you know, be in many respects a bridge builder um, and bringing people together and opening up perspectives and mindsets to what, you know, what other people think, what do they experience? And I think it 
really enriches individuals, but certainly the spheres of influence that they have. So that's a little bit about me. Oh, that's great. So unlike maybe too many people in the Detroit area, you kind of uh, went the, the global direction uh, right. versus maybe some folks because that's not a natural necessarily instinct. You know, local is like jelly made locally and warm fuzzy type stuff. And certainly the Midwest thinks of global very often as outsourcing and plants yeah. closing. And, you know, it's certainly not the warm fuzzy that, that that local feel has. And so it sounds like that's a driver of some of your activities is your sense that that globalization um, certainly sounds like something you want to be part of on a regular basis. What do you see that kind of what's the ulterior motive behind that? Is there some some good overall good that you see out of coming out of that work? Yeah, I do. I think um, I think it starts, you know, at the individual level where um, it, it, you know, when you, you step in in either in somebody else's shoes and experience life from their perspective, you just become so much more appreciative of your own situation, your own life, and you are so enriched by that. Um, but there's also, I think, an important lesson on humility that you learn through that of, you know, being, being sort of an other. And you know, as I think about the skills that um, employers are looking for and what makes a good person, um, it, it is an element of being humble about, you know, your way is not the only way or, the, you know, the best way. And, you know, if you could just be quiet for a minute and listen to other people and um, really appreciate where and how they approach the world, um, you know, it, 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 brings people sort of closer together, certainly across borders, but I think also helps, you know, individuals just be better citizens. Um, so that's, that's where the motivation comes from. I'll also say, you know, I, <laughs> I came from a very big family. I'm one of six kids and I'm in the middle. And I was always, I always saw myself as like a bridge builder between, you know, the, the, the family factions. So, so there's a personal motivation too, of just wanting to bring people together and, kind of build peace amongst you know, differing perspectives. Oh, why can't we all get along? I, I, yeah. I get it. So, so it's the, the regional part and also the family position part that has helped uh, build Jennifer Clinton for sure. Um, you've, you've had this, um, all sorts of leadership roles along the way. Uh, then you faced the opportunity with cultural vistas. What was it about cultural vistas that attracted you and, and how has that evolved? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so just a little bit about the organization. Um, we were founded back in 1963, uh, really with the mission of building bridges, um, building connections, building understanding amongst individuals and nations through work-based um, global experiences. So I think internships, fellowships, workshops, seminars. Um, what was interesting to me about the organization, and so in that context, our partners are pretty wide. We work with Fortune 500 companies in the US and, and, and abroad. We work with governments, US government, foreign governments. We work with foundations and universities. And what was intriguing for me about the organization was sort of the diverse set of partners and, um, and goals in, in terms of what each of those partners and entities are looking for. And, you know, it really is about, as I said, when you and I were speaking, sort of building the next generation of global leaders um, and doing so um, through, you know, very experiential opportunities. I think there's one thing to sort of sit in a classroom and, you know, learn from an instructor and learn from books. But when you, when you put yourself in a situation where you're actually learning by doing, as our participants do, is so, so, so powerful. Um, and that learning curve is very steep, but you, know, you, you, you gain so much by uh, you know, that, that experiential opportunity. And so that was, for me, um, I'm, I'm a very practical person, even though I started in academia, I recognize that like 
book learning is great, but um, so much more learning happens when you're actually doing. And that was with Cultural Vista is what was really intriguing to me is like, you know, these are people who take a leap, you know, they go and do the hard thing of, of actually working abroad. Um, and it's, you know, it's what happens with them during that experience is just incredible. So that was, you know, those, those, the set of dynamics was what was inspiring to me. Perhaps that practicality very, very Midwest of you. It is. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the, for better the, or for worse. Yeah, for, absolutely. <laughs> for, for better, for sure. Um, could, could you explain a little bit more about cultural vistas and kind of what are the dynamics? What's actually happening uh, that, that you're, you're talking about now? Yeah. So um, think about our work. Um, so again, overarching umbrella is we want to we want to provide opportunities and a professional setting for young people. And when I say young people, it's really eighteen to forty year olds um, uh, who travel, not so much now, but who have a an international experience, uh, either through a work based experience, um, a you know a what we call sort of a study study tour experience, where they're intensively interacting with counterparts that are in their same field or sort of works like um, intensive workshop opportunities. Um, and we do that by bringing international people into the United States. Um, and uh, we, we send Americans abroad to do that, the same kind of work. What's happening now, as you can imagine, it's been uh, very challenging. Uh, just the mobility and travel have been severely restricted. Um, so we, you know, we've been doing most of our work online, just like, you know, you in the chamber, though, you, you start, started out as a virtual entity. Did I, right, I'm not frozen. <clears throat> um, that, you know, we, we had to last year pivot most of our programs to virtual uh, programs. And I'd say, They've been very successful, um, just as you know. We're talking today virtually, and you know, almost, almost or all of your work is is virtual. That there's a lot that can be conveyed, um, can be learned, <clears throat> a lot of connections um, can be had uh, through this format. Um, on the um, immigration front, it's been pretty challenging for us. So we, you know, we bring in about 5,000 uh, participants annually to the United States. And that is, um, we are a, what's considered a, a sponsoring organization designated by the Department of State uh, for the J-1 visa. And that's been, you know, through the Trump administration been very challenging, but even now with COVID is even that much more challenging on um, trying to get people into the country. Uh, but it's but it's also I'd say really forced us to be more intentional around how do we cultivate and develop experiences whereby people can can gain an understanding of a different culture, how people can actually work with an entity in another country virtually and have a very enriching experience whereby they're they're developing important skills that. Um, you know, that, that they're getting not only the technical skills, but the soft skills of um, working across borders, working virtually on teams, trying to, you know, figure out how to communicate effectively. Um, so, you know, it, within our organization, historically, we were very focused on moving people from one country to another and putting them in situations where they're gonna have intensive learning experiences. Well, when we can't move people like that, we have to really focus on the learning experiences and the connecting experience and, and helping them develop these global skills that they're going to need for the future in a way that um, is like what you and I are doing. And it's, it's hard because you're not sitting at a restaurant eating and, and um, sort of absorbing by osmosis a different culture, but, you know, there are ways to facilitate that learning um, in an online environment that we've been, we've been pretty successful at and really proud of our team for figuring that out. Hey, Doug, you're muted. Thank you very much. There we go. Yeah. Does, does that mean that um, internships are um, uh, being done virtually as well? They are, absolutely. Um, and 
very successfully. You know, I think as we look at some of the workplace trends going forward, that that's going to be the new normal. It is the new normal. It's going to continue to be the new normal. And frankly, giving young people an opportunity to test that out early in their careers of how do you do a, a global internship virtually uh, is really, really important skill to have. And we've seen some really good success stories with it, um, whereby setting up virtual internships um, with folks, they've actually been able to convert convert to a full time um, jobs, which is really really exciting. That the you know a young person was able to have that kind of an impact in a short amount of time to then be hired on, and we're seeing many of our corporate partners, you know, most all of them, you know, ran remote internships over the past year and. Um, they tell us that they still have the intent of bringing people in physically because that is just really, you know, important and highly valued. But um, at the same time, they've learned a lot and um, there's been some great, great successes around the virtual internship model. What have you been seeing in the corporate world in terms of adapting to, to these things? Because you're kind of in the middle of everything, similar to your you know childhood as a bridge child. You're in a you're a bridge between these companies and and the folks that are bring, coming in. So you need to stay. You the organization needs to stay in touch with what they're looking for. Um, you need to stay in touch with political situations in countries around the world and economic situations. Uh, workplace dynamics and how that's evolving. You're the, the, a lot of change in the last yeah. couple of years, and so what? What are you seeing out there? Are the the uh, is everybody kind of in lockstep and kind of appreciating what needs to happen, or is there a divergence of behaviors and reactions to what's going on? That's a great question. Some of the trends that we see that we've heard directly from our corporate partners on are. They're struggling with, you know, how do you do a successful onboarding of an intern, uh, you know, an international intern in a remote environment, whereby, I mean, it's, you know, the mechanics of it are not difficult, but you know, how do you get somebody up to speed quickly? Uh, how do you uh, um, help them feel included and part of the team or the, the organization? That's something that, that they've been struggling with and have, you know, articulated to us, you know, can we, can we be helpful on that front? Um, the other thing that we're seeing is, you know, I see it in my own organization uh, and from our, our corporate partners of just being way more mindful and helpful around um, sort of the work-life balance and the stressors that have come as a result of COVID. Um, and you know, being more proactive about providing resources, providing tools, um, helping staff kind of figure out that work-life balance whereby you, know, you could technically spend your whole day. And many of these young people that, you know, are working are in really small locations and they're on the computer, you know, 10, 12 hours a day and um, maybe feel isolated. And so that, that aspect of providing a little bit more assistance on that front we've seen from companies which is you know which I think is really good and, and important and you know with with the workforce as it is now where the tenure um, of people well, sort of like that notion of loyalty building loyalty with staff members and you know how much turnover is happening and even with I mean certainly with COVID we've been reading the headlines of people just leaving their their jobs and droves and their careers and switching careers. I think that question of, you know, how do you build um, that that connection and that stickiness um, to, you know, even a young, per, you know, an intern, so that they really feel part of the organization and supported by the organization is going to become more and more important as companies are seeing, you know, the um, the downside of huge amounts of turnover that was happening prior to COVID, but certainly in COVID where, you know, look at the, um, the, the numbers of people leaving jobs at the lower levels is, is way higher than people at you know, the more senior levels because they're not making as much money. And, you know, they, they're looking for, for that connection for having, you know, strong purpose in their jobs. So, um, you know, seeing, we're, we're seeing companies sort of struggle with this on 
how do we provide that, um, that support and recognizing that it's important. Are you seeing uh, significant regional impacts or, or how people are behaving or reacting from a corporate standpoint by region or by segment or, or other trends that we might consider? And then, you know, where does this go from here? You know, what, what happens next? Where are we going to be in a year or two? Yeah, it's a good question. On the regional trends, uh, we work with a lot of companies in Silicon Valley. Um, so there, um, you know, I think they're 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 highly in tune to the the turnover rates, the high you know really high turnover rates. Um, so a lot more attention, I, and I I think also a recognition that you know providing free food and games are you know is not what's necessarily keeping employees. Um, so th- being more in tune to things like having greater social purpose um, and um, helping young people see that, you know, they are making a difference, um, I think is something that we're seeing more and more of and hearing more from young people that that's, you know, wanting to connect with um, with that purpose and, and holding their organizations accountable for what they're doing within their communities or in the global community um, is something that's, that's really important. And, I would, I would also say, and this is sort of more in the U.S. context, um, you know, on that accountability front with respect to um, diversity, equity, inclusion, there's much more of a acute attention um, from people here in the U.S. of, of really wanting to see employers uh, make and deliver commitments around um, diversity. And that's one of the areas that, that young people sort of globally are wanting to see in their places of work that there is, you know, a strong commitment to diversity of, of all of its facets. Um, so those are, those are some of the, tried, you know, I, I can speak about the, the Silicon Valley just because there's a lot of, um, a lot of our companies that are, that are there that I see, we see some of those trends. What are uh, employers asking for in the workplace? And, and now that you brought DEI up, um, I was actually on a phone call yesterday with uh, a potential new member in Canada, and we were talking through her work. And it s- started to occur to me that I've seen DEI discussed in the Americas and a little bit in Europe, but I don't remember ever any conversation related to Asia. I'm sure it's happening. I'm just not in tune with it. Um, you know what? It go, maybe goes back a little bit to the, the, the companies around the world and what's the higher priority or what are they articulating in terms of what they're looking for going forward. Uh, what are some of those things uh, that, that you're hearing that they're requiring uh, beyond the, the pandemic? You mean what they're requiring from their employees? What type of, is it, I don't know what they would be normally asking for. Are they looking for uh, young uh, young people who are have certain types of skills? You know, do they ever articulate, for instance, that they have some sort of a global mentality? Yeah. You know, what, what are some of the, what are some of the things that maybe COVID is inspiring them, them to say, look, you know, we want more than bed, you know, good ping pong players, you know, that we've kind of tricked into kind of coming into work because we've got these ping pong tables. You know, we recognize that's probably not going to work anymore. So, what are the skills and what's maybe the temperament? What are some of the the um, the, the life um, approaches that we want from not maybe not just young people, but from employees overall? Yeah, so um, definitely the, the notions that we sort of talked about earlier on around sort of this cultural cultural fluency, um, being able to, and you know, as I talked about earlier, that humility, um, being able to recognize that, yeah, you bring a lot to the table, um, but there's a lot that you need to learn. And we hear from companies that it, it really is about that sort of learning growth mindset that they're that they're looking for. I mean, they start out typically like we need X, Y, Z technical talent and the, um, the demand for that tech talent is just off the charts. Um, so that's the place where they start. Like, do they have 
are they sufficiently um, educated around artificial intelligence? Like that, that's like the, the driving theme. But then when we talk to them about what are the gaps that you're seeing with this great tech talent that you're bringing in and spending a lot of money on recruiting, it's the softer skills that I talk about. And, and right now, so I would say the number one um, soft skill is about working across teams um, in different uh, locations, like because everybody's remote. So you know, how can you know, how is one effective um, at, wor at working across time zones, working across borders, um, et cetera? That's you know so critically important. Um, so that, and then you know, I talked about the humility. I think just you know that approach around just being being an, an individual that really just wants to continue to learn. Um, and, uh, and grow and is seeking opportunities, uh, seeking mentors to just continue to um, advance, advance themselves and advance the teams that they're working on. Okay. How, how do you see trends uh, around internship, maybe on a more macro level? And then also are there, and maybe this is a different topic in question, but around training. Um, certainly remote training has become a lot more important. I'm wondering, you know, from an employer standpoint, how, how are they viewing and are they viewing training in a, in a different way or in a different light uh, going forward? Yeah. Um, so, so certainly technology is, you know, helping um, provide more access to that training um, opportunities um, for, for young people. Um, I think I think there, there is an, a, you know the, the, the traditional model of you know, bringing staff together for both sort of a social and training event. Um, now that some of that has shifted um, definitely uh, to online. Opportunities, but what what you know, what I'm seeing even in my own organization is the uh, attention being played on not just conveying content um, and you know having you know having somebody give a webinar or a, a talk via Zoom on a certain topic, but really trying to facilitate learning in small groups. Um, you know whether it's you know maybe a topic is addressed, but then it's um, you know the the emphasis being much more on how can we work together in and putting this knowledge to practice. Um, so just a lot more emphasis on again, sort of back to the experiential learning piece of it, because you know it's, it's hard to sit on Zoom for hours at a time just learning about something and 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 having you know case study examples or situational examples where I can work with a team member from another location, um, I think it really helps build those the skills that um, we're learning and, and how training is delivered is definitely adjusting. Okay, I saw a cartoon the, the other day about how school and work is different. School is you learn and then you're tested. And in life and at work, you get tested and then you learn. And then you, you learn. That's right. <laughs> Which I, I, I love. Right. I love it's, that. Uh, it's very approach. humbling. <laughs> uh, it, it, exactly. And it, it probably also goes to the types of people that, you know, these companies want, right? You know, the, you, you know, the, the book learning and the, the, the practical, the, the practicality actually you talked about earlier, I would think would be in a lot more demand, you know, go, going forward. Cause at the end of the day, you know, it's not, as easy as it used to be, right? We're doing these things in an extended way. So I'm wondering even if, you know, our intern internships are going to continue, right? And are they going to continue maybe at a macro level about the same, or is it going to continue to grow or is it going to look different, you know, going forward? I think um, the, the access to internships actually is going to, to grow significantly. Um, okay which actually I think is a good thing. So when I talk about access, it's like, you know, the ability for somebody to work um, in an international context by not even traveling um, is really pretty powerful. And you can give more people those types of global opportunities um, without many of the impediments that are happening. 
Um, so I think that's that's a positive. Um, and you know, we we've seen where um, you know people that even have like continue to maintain a full time job that just earns them money. You know, like in the summertime. That prior, to, I think prior to COVID, it was it was it was an either or situation. It's like I have to do the summer job because I'm going to I've got to make money and I can't really do anything else. Now we're, we're seeing young people who are doing the summer job working at Dunkin' Donuts, but then also being able to engage in a virtual um, substantive um, uh, internship experience that they're doing, you know, good project work that aligns with their, their degrees, um, but they just have the flexibility to do it, you know, not during necessarily regular work hours or, or work it into their, you know, three day a week Dunkin' Donut job where they can't, where they can earn money. So it's becoming more of a both. It can do both, um, which I think is, is actually really good because in that instance, and, and this is, you know, I'm talking about in a global context, I think a lot of people have been left behind um, and, and internships have been more for um, people that can afford to do it, uh, that don't necessarily have to make the choice to work at, at Dunkin' Donuts. And this is, you know, it, it just opens that up. Um, I think from an employer perspective, it opens up also, not everything's going to be virtual all the time, but it opens up more possibilities in terms of um, who you can hire. I mean, my organization, you know, we've got, we're fully remote and it's the first time in our history that we've had people working in probably 20 different states. Uh, we've hired interns uh, in different countries that are working effectively with us and it just broadens the talent pool. Um, and, you know, all the benefits of hiring interns and particularly international interns that you know, bring a global perspective to your workforce give you an opportunity to really understand the market markets that you are either working in or want to work in, giving you access to local knowledge that can all be had much more easily than, um, you know, sort of pre pandemic. And there, there's some really good things that come of that. Okay. But it, I think there will be more hybrid too. Some people going in and doing you know, in-person and traveling abroad to do internships and, and others that will take advantage of the virtual. Okay, so really what you're saying is the there's more flexibility now. Um, uh, and the, the concept that you talked about where you could actually get a paying job separately, do the internship, maybe, maybe paying part of something that would be a local thing with someone and then doing the internship separately just to get the skills. Uh, those kinds of flexibilities are coming into play and hence your belief that internships will actually increase quite a bit going forward. So that's yeah. interesting. And when like, you think about just even the trends on right now, the global, um, global, certainly what's happening in the U.S. of labor shortages, you know, this trend of both higher unemployment rates, but labor shortages, um, Particularly in certain sectors, in the, in the IT sector in particular, is like this. This gives um, you know another pipeline of talent to really do some sort of mission critical work um, by people that are highly educated that really want to contribute. Um, so I, you know, I think it really helps on that front too. Of the dynamics sort of the the marketplace labor force dynamics that are happening right now. Interesting. Where, how did you, especially a lot of the internships that, that you've done with Cultural Vistas, you know, ends up being a foreign student coming in and into a U.S. situation. And so part of the learning is kind of surviving on the ground, if you will, and intercultural kind of nuance type stuff. You know, how important is that? And is there some way to simulate that in another way? How kind of work? where does your head go relative to that and is it really important you know and how important is the stuff that you miss by being in person having lunch maybe with somebody you know physically um it probably avoids a lot of you know uh, sexual harassment type issues <laughs> which I guess 
a good thing. It certainly mm -hmm. makes the internship a lot easier um, in terms of not having to worry about housing and moving and the, the logistics of the whole process. So, so what, what, what do we really lose out and how do we replace that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we definitely lose out um, by not having the in-person interaction and engagement. Um, but, you know, in the last year and a half where we've had really no option to, to have that, but as we go forward and we hopefully move past COVID, I, I would see it longer term as a continuum whereby, you know, particularly in the global space where a lot of people just, you know, aren't ready to dip their toes into an abroad work experience physically, um, they can do so virtually um, and, and, you know, have some good cultural learning, um, but then it gets them ready to actually take the leap, hopefully, um, to do an in-person internship or frankly, you know, maybe job. Uh, if they've done a couple of you know, virtual experiences, it, it builds their confidence, it builds, you know, their, their feeling like this is something that I can do. So I, I, I could see it being, you know, the first step of a global work experience um, that is way more accessible um, to do that then builds that, 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 that confidence and appetite to actually go in person. Uh, to your question about what, you know, how, how can you replace it um, in, a, in a virtual environment? There are, there are some things that we're doing of, um, you know, our programs are experiential in nature. So it's a lot of doing, but what we're, we're doing a lot more of is facilitating more reflection around um, and, and conversation in between the doing of what's actually happening. What are you seeing with respect to how, you know, your supervisors are communicating to each other or to you and, and really trying to help them think about what are the elements of culture, um, differences, similarities that they're seeing. And that takes work and that takes more work on our on our, our side of it, but in order to really benefit from the cross-cultural experience, you have to bring people's attention to it and, and, and help them pay it more attention to it because it's not, it's not as obvious. Um, so you have to kind of point them into the direction of what are these cultural cues that they're either getting or, or not getting and that they need to pay attention to so that they can walk away from the experience having been enriched by it. Very cool. I, I, I really like the way you've explained that. And I also like what you said about, you know, some of these things may not necessarily be given in an internship in some cases. And so, but enough of a taste has happened where they can then go to Japan and right. or come into the U.S. and get a job you know, but they've they've got the a lot of the professional side of it done. Now they're they they fill in this other hole on the intercultural or interpersonal, in person interpersonal uh, with the job, um, yeah. and it might give them a chance to be exposed to more things ahead of yeah. ahead of that big decision. Yeah, and and they've built a bit of a network too, right? Yeah. A virtual yeah. network where they're going to feel right. way more comfortable. You know, knowing somebody in you know in whatever country that they're thinking about going to, and just having that familiarity is, is huge. Wow, God, yeah, love it, love it. So you've given us a bit of a crystal ball on uh, internships and where that's headed. What's going to happen with immigration? That's a tougher oh my one. Gosh. That's so hard oh, and so frustrating. <laughs> um, so on the U.S. side, that's kind of where. We, we focus a lot because we have so many people coming into the U.S. And, you know, I, I'm not an immigration expert. Um, our, our area of expertise is um, kind of the non-immigrant visa, which is for us the J-1 visa that brings in people up to two years. They can do uh, a traineeship or an internship or work as a teacher. But, you know, what I'll say about that um, also relates to the H-1Bs, L visas, et cetera. So the two trends that are, um, that are uh, prohib like prohibitive right now is certainly the travel, the travel restrictions um, where we have, you know, 
there's just uh, executive order restrictions in place from a number of countries, Brazil, China, Ireland, UK, South America, India, and the Schengen areas of Europe. Um, so that's basically not allowing people to even come into the country. Uh, and then I think even worse than that is just the backlog and uh, the operational status of the US consulates around the world. Uh, it's very varied um, in terms of uh, what, what their staffing levels are, what their resources are, what their operating status is in the country. Um, so as of this summer, there was a backlog of about two and a half million uh, visas in all categories sitting there. Um, now some people are coming, there are, there are visas being processed and the State Department has prioritized um, you know, immigrant uh, visas uh, over non-immigrant visas that, that we work in. Uh, but it's just, it's been really frustrating. Um, and, you know, a lot of advocacy work happening in DC and, you know, from the private sector around really trying to resource the consulates uh, in a way that they can um, work through this backlog. Um, but, you know, the longer term issues are still there. You know, Canada, just as an example, just surpassed the US as uh, the number one destination country for international workers. It's the first time it's been above the United States. And the trends there are really about kind of our internal environment, our non-friendliness to immigrants in general. Um, you know, the, the George Floyd um, um, uh, protests last year, I mean, the, the perception of America not being a super inclusive place, uh, that's hurting us. And when we have, you know, major gaps in talent, um, we have now major uh, investments in infrastructure that we need to go, you know, put la a labor force towards, we're really hurting ourselves by not having a sound and, um, you know, uh, practical immigration strategy. And it's, it's, it's going to hurt us. And it has hurt us in, in the short term, it will hurt us in the long term. That, that makes sense. Very, very sad to watch. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, one is related to a big event that you have coming up on October 27th. Curious to learn more about that and how global chamber members can be involved. Yeah, thanks for asking. So every year, over the, since for the last, I guess, four years, we've been doing um, an annual event that you know, typically brings people together um, to celebrate. Uh, and we like to hold up and recognize uh, individuals and entities that are doing great work in the space of global talent development. Uh, but the last two years, we've been doing it virtually, which has, again, opened up access to people from around the world. And we welcome Global Chamber members, absolutely. And so we, we, we feature, um, this year we'll be featuring uh, our global visionary, Parag Khanna, uh, who is uh, really an incredible thought leader, writer, journalist. You can see him on all the news outlets, but he's based in Singapore. He's got a new book coming out called Move, The Forces Offending Us. Uh, and it's all about the future of work, the future of uh, the global workplace, how people are thinking about mobility, um, what the trends are, and I think very relevant to um, what global chamber members are thinking about. Uh, and then we'll also be uh, recognizing and awarding IBM and their uh, chief head of global diversity, equity, and inclusion, Carla Grant Pickens, who's just done an amazing job on many of the things that we that you asked me about, Doug, in terms of um, you know really cultivating this um, uh, workforce, this global workforce, uh, in terms of training, in terms of inclusion. Uh, and we worked together with IBM uh, over the last year on an initiative that they started, a global initiative, initiative that they started called Working Positively. And it is uh, really about um, encouraging employers around the world to be much more open about uh, their employees who are um, HIV positive. And um, just, you know, again, like reinforcing that supportive um, environment, workplace environment, and we, we want to recognize them for that. We're, we're a partner to them. They host our J1 interns, global interns, and um, we'll be recognizing them. And Carla will have a lot to say about uh, some of the things that I talked about as a model 
uh, company with respect to uh, inclusivity and um, you know how they're they're really um, supporting educating their workforce um, so there'll be lots of things to learn from her and then finally we'll be recognizing a couple of our amazing alumni um, who are just doing terrific things uh, around the world to impact their communities in a positive way um, and so it should be a lot of fun. It's on October 27th uh, from 12 to 1 Eastern time. It's free for all attendees. Uh, we'll have some musical entertainment um, and just, you know, we welcome, we welcome you and you know, all the chamber members to join us. And you can check it out on our website at culturalvistas.org. Definitely check it out. And uh, I've actually already signed up. So I got my ticket, I'm ready, ready to rumble. Uh, so looking forward to that October 27th is also on the Global Chamber agenda, uh, our calendar of events. And so um, definitely I encourage everybody to, to, to take a look at that. Final, final question, uh, what did we leave out? What else uh, would you like to share today? And then, you know, the question we always ask is how can we help? You know, how can the Global Tribe further help and advance what you're doing? Yeah, thanks. So one maybe statistic that I'll leave you all with that was, um, you know, kind of alarming to me was this came out of the American Management Association, uh, where 18% of their multinational corporations um, say they have a strong global leadership pipeline, meaning that they have the talent that they need to, to drive their companies forward in a global context. And that's pretty alarming given how long globalization has been around and the fact that it's growing despite the pandemic. All the signs are pointing to that, that trade is up, cap uh, capital flow globally is up. The only thing that's really down in terms of globalization is mobility. So, so that to me just tells me there's a lot of work to do that, that we need to do, chamber members, organizations like ours, the education sector around really developing um, those global skills and competencies to equip young people to be effective in a global context. Um, you know, whether it's providing an international internship um, or really honing in on you know, what, it is, what it takes to be effective and culturally fluent and working across borders, working across time zones, um, being, being humble and, um, you know, advocating for yourself in, in, a, in a context where you, you, know, you really have to um, be um, entrepreneurial and you know, figure things out. It's just, you know, we've, we've got to do more. And if we, want our, our, um, if we want globalization to continue to stay and all the benefits that come with it, um, we've, got to be, we've got to be supporting our young people um, to be effective at it. And, you know, not just a slice of our young people, um, you know, giving access and equity to people that typically just don't have um, the opportunities to work in a global context. So I guess that's my sort of call to action to everybody. Of, um, and, you know, how specifically you, the Global Chamber folks can help is, um, you know, reach out to us and, you know, you can, you can host uh, global interns. You can, we're going to be launching a new program next year of sending out, you um, uh, mid-career professionals to um, uh, programs overseas whereby you're focusing in on um, specific industry types that um, we can share more with you, Doug, when it's ready for print. Um, but, you know, just take a look at our website. There's ways ways to be involved with us um, and really just sort of spreading the word about uh, getting your kids, getting your friends' kids involved and encourage them to, to think globally and um, integrate that into their career development. The 18% number is uh, shocking, but not unexpected. Um, yeah. I think I really appreciate you sharing, sharing that. I recently, over the last several weeks, started to write a blog about, and completed it about what international companies struggle with, you know, from my own personal experience in, in, a, in a multinational and then with Global Chamber watching our members struggle at er, nearly every turn. Uh, with a variety of different issues, almost almost always related to people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, and skills and capabilities. And so the fact that 
you're addressing that need is so critically important. So keep it up. It was uh, Kofi Annan who said, arguing against globalization is like arguing against the laws of gravity. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah. We know it's, it's, it's a good thing, ultimately. There are challenges along the way. And so thank you and Cultural Vistas for making it a little bit easier. Still many challenges ahead, but we support you and, and love your work. And thank you so much uh, for taking the time today to share more. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Doug. Keep up the great work for you you all. We really appreciate you and all that you're doing to keep us close and keep us keep us educated and up to speed on you know what we need to be thinking about. So really appreciate it. But let's keep moving it forward. Uh, we never quite get there. Uh, nope. And it sometimes, you know, that is a little frustrating. However, you know, the work that you're doing and uh, is, is contributing to a better workplace and a, and a better world. Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everybody who's here, whether this is a podcast that you're listening to or you're checking us out on YouTube. Um, we really appreciate you listening. And if you have any questions, you'd like to get a hold of Jennifer or understand more about Sorry, uh, my, I was receiving a phone call. If you'd like to hear more about cultural vistas, maybe even participate. One of the things Jennifer talked about was you know, having an intern you know, and, and supporting on that side of things. Those are all available. So I encourage you to check out their website, uh, attend the meeting on October 27th, the big event. You know, listen to what some people are doing uh, around the world, including IBM terms of their advancing these uh, really important issues and get involved. Thanks again, Jennifer. Have a great rest of your Friday and good weekend as well. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Thanks to you all. Take care. Thanks, everybody.